I want you to look down at your hands. Open and close. Move your thumb around. Oppose your thumb. Now, I want you to shake the hand of your neighbor. Go ahead. Shake the hand of your neighbor. Do you feel the warmth? Enough. Do you, do, do you, do you feel the warmth? Do you feel the connection to another human being? You just did. How many of you hold the hand of your loved one? Your boyfriend, your girlfriend, friend, your husband, your wife, your grandchild, your child? Hands. Amazing tools, amazing machines. Now imagine this. An hour after TED Talks, you go home, you don't feel so well. You're getting sicker by the minute. You go to the emergency room. The doctors say, you have an infection. You're really sick. Within hours, you're in the intensive care unit on drugs that are keeping you alive, but are closing down the circulation in your arms and legs. A few hours later, my colleagues, a physician will come in and tell you if you're awake, and your family, in order for you to live, or your loved one, loved one to live, we have to amputate, amputate both arms and legs, all four extremities. Think about what life would be like, the impact of that on your families. How would you eat? How would you toilet yourself? How would you dress? You would miss the handshake. And even if you were fitted with prosthetics, the artificial devices of plastic and metal that allow a lot of amputees to function, it wouldn't be the same. And for all four limbs being amputated, the energy to put these on, how would you do it? You didn't have hands. Think about that. Modern medicine can save lives, but we're not very good at restoring or saving limbs until recently. I'd like you to meet three of my patients, people just like you and I. In a few harrowing days, their life was changed. No arms, legs, just like that, all from infection. Lindsay, Zion, and Laura. Now this is Lindsay S., a Virginia Commonwealth University grad, fashion model, fashion designer. She was engaged to be married to a very, very handsome young man who I met. Due to an intra-abdominal catastrophe, an infection, within a few days, her legs were amputated both below the knee and her arms just below the elbow. Now keep this picture in mind. She's determined, beautiful, and focused. This is the Lindsay I met. Withdrawn, isolated from the world. Look at her prosthetics. They're on the counter, they're on the floor. She's not wearing them. It's very interesting. When she came to me with this handsome young man, she said, Dr. Levin, should we get married and then I have my baby? Or should we get married, then you give me hands, then I have a baby? Now, patients have asked me a lot of questions. I was dumbfounded. I didn't know what to tell her. We had our first consultation. A few weeks, weeks and months went by. She came back, this time no fiancé, just her mother. Our own Penn's Ben Franklin said, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. And so I put together a team of surgeons, transplant physicians, nurses, anesthesiologists, social workers, pharmacists, psychiatrists, and we prepared. We prepared to give Lindsay new hands. The intricacies of transplanting a human hand involve the connection of bones, tendons, and under the operating microscope, which is my passion, the connection of small arteries and veins, as you saw in the video, and the sutures we use are so small, they can pass through a human hair, a human hair. Three one thousandths of an inch. Think about that. I can't see it unless I'm looking under the scope. 
Teamwork, teamwork is the essence to success. In many things we do in medicine, but particularly this new field of hand transplantation. Along with 10 attending surgeons, 30 nurses, residents, fellows, anesthesiologists, and in a 12 and a half hour operation, Lindsay had her new hands attached to her body by four independent teams of surgeons working, two teams on the donor arms, two teams on Lindsay, and then two teams came together to attach the arms to Lindsay's body. This is the flow chart we prepared. I don't expect you to read this. Talking about each surgeon's expertise, what they did when, and when they did it. Connecting the arteries, the nerves, the tendons, the bones, and so forth. And everything had to work perfectly, on time, technically performed correctly. I got to be conductor of this surgical symphony, I'll call it. One of my teachers in surgery said, preparation, preparation is the only shortcut you need. And similar to an airline pilot who may have flown some of you here today, the pilot has checklists for what? For safety before takeoff. And we compiled, you can see it here, we compiled a checklist. This is the clipboard of what we would do when, how long it would take, which structure we would repair, and we performed every part of the operation in sequence. Now, the way we did this, the way we prepared, we practiced this operation in what we call the Penn Human Tissue Laboratory. And that's a cadaveric facility, cadavers, that we used to simulate, simulate operating room conditions. And we followed our checklist, and as you'll see, we got things right based on our practice. So Lindsay went from an individual, you can see here on the screen, withdrawn from society. Look at her. Totally withdrawn, no arms, no hands, no human touch, to a woman a few months later with reconnection of the nerves into her muscles from the donor, the ability to write her own name again. <laughs> so let me tell you a little more. She was able to rise and run. Here she is in her, doing her CrossFit routine. Contrast of two pictures. Which one would you want to be? CrossFit. Next, I'd like to tell you about a child by the name of Zion Harvey. Zion was a very cute little two-year-old boy, and similar to Lindsay S., developed an infection at the age of two. And he almost died. Both his hands were amputated, both his legs below the knee, and his mother, Patty Ray, in addition to caring for this quadrimembranal amputee, four extremities missing, she had to give him, to keep him alive, her kidney. Her kidney. So she was an organ donor to Zion. And in the process of donating, donating a kidney to him, he went on drugs called immunosuppressive drugs to keep the body from rejecting the kidney. And he came to me and, and Patty said, I want you to give my son hands. Never been done. So working with the Gift of Life, which is our Philadelphia Organ Procurement Organization, and UNOS, which is the United Network for Organ Sharing, that can identify donors, we got some information. As it turns out, there are only 15 children a year in the United States that would be eligible to donate hands to Zion. Size, shape, gender, race. 15 children. And that's assuming one of those 15 children's parents would say, yes, at the time of death, you can have, you can have my child's hands for Zion. So think about that. Never in the world prior to Zion Harvey, had there been a pediatric hand transplant? Never. Someone had to be first. And Zion was the first perfect child, as I explained to you, 
he was already on the drugs that prevent rejection. You with me so far? Okay. There were serious, serious ethical concerns. First of all, 15 kids, right? Can we find a donor? Maybe we prepare to treat him. Our team prepares for two years, practice the operation. We can't find a donor. Okay, we found a donor. We go to do the operation. We can't get the hands to, to work. That's a possibility. We operate on him, we give him hands, and then his kidneys fail, and he needs another kidney. We're in the operating room, we operate on him, Zion dies. Then what? So these were all the concerns that we had. We decided to go forward. And this is a critical story of advancement in medicine, and our team lived it. Like Goldilocks and the Three Bears, Here's how we prepared. We did 3D modeling of what we thought Zion's new hands would look like. How big did they have to be? We would accept 20% too small from a donor, 20% too large. Hopefully, we get it just right. And sometimes in medicine, despite planning and so forth, there's luck in the things we do, luck. And on the day we received a call that we had a family actually willing to donate their child's hands for Zion, I flew to the donor hospital. Child was on life support. And here are the models next to the hands of the donor, within three millimeters. So we didn't need 20%, 20% just right, like Goldilocks. Now I'd like to take you into the operating room and sort of show you the magic moment of blood going into his new hands. See what you think. Blood is going across the hookup here. And you can see the hand right here starting to pink up. You see the capillary refill? Do you see that? See it's white when I touch it? And then it pinks up. And now that's starting to get out to the level of the finger. So that's how we do it. That's the legend and the history and the legacy of what we call reconstructive microsurgery, using the operating microscope to see the small vessels and use the small sutures to make those connections that give life and blood into these new body parts. And this was a monumental moment in the history of hand transplant, the fact that the, the, the hands pinked up. Thank goodness, I thought, that's the first thing we have to get going here. And our team motto has always been, failure is not an option. Failure is not an option, particularly in the first case in the world. And I have to credit my partners and my colleagues. The collective wisdom of our team allowed us, this time in eight and a half hours, to give Zion two new hands. The surgeon, Sir Charles Bell, said, hands are the beautiful and ready instruments of the mind. This was an 18th century surgeon offering us this very, very profound concept. Now, jump ahead with me 275 years. Remember, Zion didn't have hands at the age of two. His brain went to sleep. And based on sophisticated imaging techniques, using the MRI scanners and so forth, stuff that I don't even understand, my neurology colleagues understand it, we are able to study now the electrical impulses and the pathways from Zion's brain that had been asleep to his new hands. Remember Charles Bell? And from the hands back to his brain. And studying this child has created tremendous in interest by my, colleag my colleagues at Penn Medicine in Neurology, and at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia where this was done. They're, they're amazed at this. And you can see we can study these pathways. Zion has worked very, very hard. Each of these patients require hours and hours a day of physical therapy, occupational therapy, to learn how to new, use their new hands, connect, connect the nerves, the pathways to the brain, the brain to the hands. Very, very complex. And he's regained incredible abilities, like Lindsay, that include throwing a baseball. Let me show you. Please join us in welcoming nine-year-old Zion Harvey. Okay, Zion, whenever you're ready, it's your pitch.
pretty good. His fastball is better than mine. Our third and final patient is a woman by the name of Laura Nataf. And at the age of 19, similar to Lindsay, similar to Zion, she lost both her arms just below the elbow and both her legs below the knee. And she was waiting more than eight years in Paris, France for hands on a donor list due to a variety of factors. She couldn't get transplanted in, in France at the time. And my dear colleague, Professor Laurent Lanteri, who's done seven face transplants, transplant of the human face in Paris, reached out to me and he said, Scott, this girl's been on the waiting list. Can you help? So I said, sure. And our Penn team expanded our horizons now globally to patients around the world, from around the world, that want hands. She came to Philadelphia. She was evaluated by her team, worked up, and again, desperate to have hands, she made this commit to, commitment to us. We again went back to our cadaver lab, and after two years of preparation, she flew to Philadelphia, and we gave her hands in about 10 hours, her dream and our privilege. The world of solid organ transplant, just a few short weeks ago, lost a patriarch by the name of Thomas Starzl. And he was in favor of this new field we call vascularized composite allotransplantation, or hand transplant for short. Starzl was a remarkable surgeon. The early patients that he transplanted for liver transplant, the father of they died on the table. They had all sorts of complications. He had all sorts of obstacles. And yet he persisted. And I stand with my team on the shoulders of this giant, following my convictions. That's what he told me here. Follow your convictions. With my team, we were able to transform the lives of these three patients. I'm a previous Army reservist, served in the US military. And what is this story about? More than giving hands to Zion and Laura and Lindsay, that's great. We're proud of that. We have over 1,500 wounded warriors who've lost their limbs defending our freedom. And while hand transplant is not for all of them, many do extremely well with prosthetics, upper and lower extremity prosthetics. We owe these soldiers a debt of gratitude, and perhaps if they desire, if they desire the possibility to receive new hands. In closing, I want you to applaud with your hands, not as a tribute to my talk, not as a tribute to my talk, but applaud the courage of these three patients, their donor families, my teammates at Penn, and those that have come before me in transplantation and reconstructive microsurgery. Thank you very much. <laughs>